last evening with Lowell, and we're looking forward to his lesson tonight as well. Uh, we'll start off with a word of prayer. Um, Mike, would you mind leading us in that first prayer tonight? And at the close of service, um, Chris Reed, if you wouldn't mind leading us in a, a closing prayer. You'll do it anyway. <laughs> so, uh, So much for this opportunity just to come together tonight and study your word, learn about you, and learn about your son and your teaching. It's been so uplifting these few days to be able to spend time with our brother that, that you've blessed so much and give him the ability and the knowledge and the willingness to teach your word and to go out into the world and spread your word. It's uplifted our hearts here and our souls, and we pray that we will encourage one another to take these teachings and these opportunities to just spend time together and the joyfulness of being around the people that we love to be with, and that we will enjoy that, we will also share that with others, and that that joy will reflect in our attitudes and our on our faces and on our hearts and hopefully on others' hearts. You've blessed us in so many different ways and we know we, we always mention and we approach you in a humble manner that we are so unworthy of all the blessings that you provide for us. And we're just so thankful that you made us a part of your creation and a part of your plan to to be here and to share the, our love with one another, especially those who are in desperate need of love, those who don't have anybody to, to share that with and to spend the time to teach them and to be an example for them. And I pray that we will do that, that we will be attentive to those around us that are in need and that could use a a smile, a hug, or, or just a kind word from your teaching. We love you so much, and we're so thankful for your son and the life he lived, and of course the sacrifice that he made. We pray that as we live our lives, we will remember that in the forefront of our minds daily, and it will be a part of our daily routine that we understand that. small we are and how significant we are to you at the same time and we're just so blessed that you again made us a part of that pray that we would share that with others <clears throat> we pray tonight dear Lord that we come here to uplift each other that we have the mindset of that we, we want to show others our joy and, and share this time and May it be beneficial to your kingdom and to each of our souls. We understand that that's the most important, that we share that love that you've taught us to uplift our souls and protect our souls and protect one another's souls. So we are so thankful for that home that you provided for us that awaits us. We pray that we will help each other to try very hard to get to be with you in those homes one day that is so special to us. We just pray that you will continue to bless us and look after us and we just pray that each day that we spend here on this earth, we pray that we will find favor in you and that we will be the type of Christian that is that you set forth the example of in the in your teaching. We just pray that we will just love this congregation and 
love your people and always love your son and that the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. It's in his loving name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll have two songs before the sermon. Does Jesus care? Does Jesus care when my heart is safe to be
it's about time to go home. <laughs> I've certainly enjoyed being with you these last few days, and you have been uh, a great encouragement to me, and I appreciate that. I, I don't know when I've ever um, worshiped with someone where the meeting got started off with such a bang. Um, the potluck, I meant. No, uh, no, 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 not the potluck. The potluck was great. Uh, but um, having two men selected as and appointed um, elders is, that's, is a great thing. I know for you all, and it was encouraging for me to witness that. And it's been a good week. I, I've been so sorry that uh, a number of folks have been sick and uh, certainly hope and pray that they get better soon. But I appreciated your being here, your encouragement, your kindnesses, uh, your hospitality. Uh, tonight I got to eat with Jack and Carol, and uh, they took me to this little cheap place where, you know, uh, no, it was excellent. Had shell oyster or something. Yeah. Uh, it's great. But every meal with you all, um, whether in your home or otherwise, it's been great. And you've just been so kind. Got to visit today again with Glenn and was it Josh. Josh Weber. What's your name? No. Uh, Josh Weber. Yeah. Um, enjoy visiting those guys too and today and just been great. Enjoyed very, very, very much. So tonight, I uh, would like for us to talk a little bit about change, what I was going to discuss and talk about tonight. Felt like it might be a, a, a more appropriate, more encouraging lesson to you. But do you ever worry? I think we all do. About something. Sometimes. Um, worry is, I believe, uh, one of the devil's weapons against us. And tonight, I, I really want to talk about what Jesus said. Not to worry about your life. Now, I believe, I believe Jesus is truth. I believe everything he says is right. When I hear him say that, I, I kind of panic because I do worry about my life. Um, the older I get, it seems like the more I worry. Um, so we're going to look at this passage in Matthew chapter 6. And you may recall this particular passage in this particular chapter. And what I want to do is I want to read with you those few verses there. So I think it would be helpful for us to uh, get started that way. And then we'll, we'll comment a bit about what Jesus is saying to us. You notice in verse 24, and I'm reading from New American Standard Version. And it says in verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat, what you will drink, or for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet, I say to you, that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, we wear clothing. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now my guess is uh, all of us have read that portion or that section of Scripture, chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, many, many times. The greatest preacher that ever preached preached the greatest sermon that has ever been proclaimed, and it's recorded for us in those three chapters. I want you to think about the audience just for a moment. Who's Jesus talking to? Well, when you read the Gospels, one thing is always evident. There's a bunches of people there. The majority of those people are the common everyday people. There would be some of the ruling hierarchy of the Jews. And many times when you see in the text, it will talk about the people and it will talk about the Jews. Well, it's not that the people aren't Jews. It's just the fact that the writers are referring to the Jews as the rulers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, etc. So the people that are there, more than likely the majority of them, if not all of them, are very poor people. It is interesting here that the audience on this Sermon on the Mount probably just in the area there of Capernaum on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus talks to them about not worrying about their lives. Now why would they worry? Why would poor people worry? Well, what am I going to eat? How am I going to clothe myself? How am I going to drink? But one of the profound things about the teaching of Jesus, he didn't mean that just for poor people. He meant that for us, rich people. Isn't it interesting that rich people still worry about food, clothing? Well, maybe not in the exact same way as one that is poor and destitute. But nonetheless, there is a concern. So I want to kind of take us through, step by step, through this passage, just to examine it a bit. I, I'm quite confident you've done that a number of times before. But I really wanted to encourage us all about how God watches over us. My wife is into birds. She likes birds. She feeds birds. Spends a lot of money on feeding birds. <laughs> and and I, I've mentioned to her a number of times this passage that, you know, God will take care of the birdies. <laughs> you feed the birdies. You don't need to go to the store and buy mega bunches of food because God will take care of them birdies. Well, she believes she's working as one of the tools of the Lord <laughs> to feed the birdies. And that's okay. Little birds, they're, they're a beautiful little creature, aren't they? We're sort of partial to bluebirds and um, various little wrens and just different little birds and hummingbirds. And Jesus said he cares about them. One of the great things that I'll mention to you again in a moment. Aren't you more important than a bird? The answer to that is yes. God cares for the lilies of the field. Aren't you more important than that? Yes. So what are we worrying about? So hope for us to be able to study, to encourage each other. And we leave tonight a little bit more determined trust God more. And if I was to ask you, do you really trust the Lord? I think everyone here would say, yes, I trust the Lord. But so did the disciples that we mentioned the other night when they were on the boat and the storm came. We trust the Lord with all of our heart and we do not lean on our own understanding, but let there come up a windstorm and woohoo. So, 
We're tested daily on our trust of the Lord. And I use, use there's lots of things, uh, lots of examples we could use, but Hebrews 11, 24 and 26 is the example of Moses. And how he made a choice. He made a choice to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin for a season with all the riches of Egypt. Now, that was a big choice. That was a big decision. Moses chose to trust God. You ever think about how tough it would have been to give up living in Pharaoh's house and live as a slave? That had to be tough. You know, we're, we, I think most of us, we can handle living on a lower level and then go up a step or two. We seem to handle that just fine. We adapt real well with that. But if you're up a few steps and you have to go down a few steps, that is tough. But your trust of God enters in. Material possessions is one of our greatest challenges. I, I, I understand completely why brethren pray this way. They pray that be with those preachers who are in difficult places. I understand that. I pray for them too. I've visited those difficult places. And it's difficult. And they need prayers. But I'm not sure that being a preacher in the United States is not more difficult because of the temptations and all of the fineries that we have and the affluence that we have that turns our heart away from God. Remember Solomon? So having said that, three times in this great text, in verse 25, 31, and 34, Jesus said, do not worry. So here's my point. Whenever the Lord says anything, and he only says it one time, that's enough. That's the truth. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. <laughs> right? But in this text, he says it three times. I want to suggest to you that the Holy Spirit does not stutter. The Holy Spirit recorded what the Lord said, and the Lord said it three times, and that usually means emphasis. The question is, are we listening? I have to repeat myself and repeat myself and repeat myself uh, in the Bible class I teach every day. 15 and 16 year olds are at times a bit of a challenge. And I take that as a challenge. I jump on that wild bronco and I just go for it. I spur them when it's necessary. I enjoy teaching. There is a sense of innocent awareness, uh, a beginning of maturity. All of that's at different levels. But they want to know. They want to know what's right. They want to know what's wrong. Well, why is that wrong? Is a great question. Not because I said so. They want to know the mental gymnastics of that. And I always lead them to what the text says. Well, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said three times, do not worry. If you don't learn anything else from this lesson, write down somewhere, Jesus said three times, do not worry. He meant it. Obvious question. Is it a sin to worry when Jesus said three times, don't do it? I think that would be a yes. So where exactly are our treasures? This is important to the text, and it's a little bit prior to that. And when we're talking about text or contextual, we're talking about verses before, during, and after. 
And so sometimes you got to read a little bit extra to get the, the complete thought. But do you remember there in chapter 6 and verse 19 that do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal? But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And, and I'm sure you're quite familiar with the grammatical um, uh, language of not but. Did you notice there, not, verse 19, 20, but? The not is, is it, it, it's there not to be an absolute you cannot do that. It's a comparison. It's a, it's a matter of priority. So Jesus is not condemning and saying you can't have a bank account or you can't save up for a rainy day, that sort of thing. But what's more important than that? Physical things are okay. He says, but store for yourself treasures in heaven. So here's what I want you to make sure you understand. There are two treasuries here. One's on earth and one is in heaven. And treasures, contextually, he's using that as a, a metaphor as to, to, for us to understand. He's talking about your goals, your interests, your activities, about what's most important in your life. So if someone is storing up treasures in heaven, their goals, interests, activities, they make God and spiritual things the most important thing in their life. Now remember, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. We're going to get to chapter 6 and verse 33, which we read, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Contextually, that's the food, the drink, and the clothing. So if you put the Lord first, you don't have to worry about those other things because God will take care of you. Why? Because he takes care of the birdies. Because he takes care of the lilies of the field. He'll take care of you. Aren't you more important? Then he says, O oh, ye of little faith. So this is a problem with poor people, with rich people, with every kinds of people. Is that we're concerning ourselves about things that are not that important. So these treasuries that we have is, again, Jesus is not forbidding us to have stuff or saving for a rainy day. Someone has said it's not wrong to possess things. However, it's wrong for things to possess us. Um, my parents are gone. My wife's parents, well, she's, her father is still living. He's will soon be 96 years old. Um, but we've collected all my mom and dad's stuff She's collecting all of her mom and dad's stuff, and then we bought our own stuff, and we got a bunch of stuff. We got a bunch of stuff. And while I was in Africa last year, we were uh, getting ready to, to, we sold our home, and my wife was on Facebook selling all of our stuff. And she sold all of our stuff. And uh, I could get on Facebook, whenever it's at Wi-Fi from time to time, and I look, look on there, and you're selling that? She sold my little potty chair. <laughs> she, showed, she sold my high chair. I've had that for 25 years now. <laughs> she sold it. So I texted her. I said, babe, you, <laughs> what else are you selling here? <laughs> I'm going to sell everything I got. We have too much stuff. Then when we finally moved into our house and we moved all that stuff, I told her I really need to go to, I need to go to Africa again and you need to sell some more stuff. <laughs> we got too much stuff. Have you ever noticed that um, these storage unit places, storage unit places they're building those things everywhere. Have you ever gone to one of those places and asked to rent one? They're very expensive and they'll usually say we're full up. Just out of curiosity, if you want to raise your hand, that's fine. How many of you park, how many have a garage and you actually park your car in your garage? Raise your hand. Well, there's a couple of three of them. Okay. Most people, most people's got it full of, guess what? Stuff. And they can't park their car in their garage. My wife said, when we move to this house, I'm parking my car in the garage. We're going to have to get rid of some stuff. 
Okay, so I went down that road a long ways. So why do we have that? What well, we don't want to get rid of that because we might need it. You know, this would belong to so and so, and this belong to so and so, and then this is precious, and this is. Oh, we don't ever look at it except when we move. <laughs> but it's precious to us. Okay, I think you you get the point, right? So where are our treasures? Jesus is saying your treasures need to be in heaven, not earth. He did not say it's sinful to have stuff. But you must be very careful about the stuff. Selfishly hoarding things to the exclusion of putting God first is sinful. Remember the parable that Jesus talked about? Fighting the marriage feast, invited them to the marriage feast. They couldn't come. They married one, a bought oxen, bought a piece of land. What was he doing? Putting their own interests and their own desires above the invitation. What was the point? God invites us to this great feast. What are we doing? We don't go to the feast because we're doing other stuff. That was his point. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15 through 21, is the um, parable, story, if you will, about the rich farmer. Now, when you read that story, and I'm not going to take the time to reread all of that, you're very familiar with it, I'm sure, is that there was a, there was a rich man and his farm was very productive. He says, I'm going to tear down old barns and build bigger barns and, and store up many goods and, and going to say, well, take it easy. Enjoy the blessings of all the prosperity. Well, was it wrong to be a farmer? No. Was it wrong to be productive and successful? No. Was it wrong to tear down old barns, build new barns, store all this stuff? No. But, but Jesus made it very, very clear. He said, you fool." This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own all that you have prepared? Many years ago, the very first home my wife and I bought, it was a house that was about, probably about 1,000 square feet. This would have been in the early 80, uh, 1980s. And I think it cost us $44,000. Well, it might as well have been a million dollars. We couldn't afford it. Back then, I think Jimmy Carter was maybe president. Interest rates were like 18, 19%. We had a negative amortization loan. In other words, each month we went in the hole. Every month. We left there owing more money on the house than we bought it for. That was genius on our part. <laughs> but in the backyard, we had a little garden. And we loved strawberries. We made a little strawberry patch. We worked hard, got the weeds out, ate the strawberries. We, we loved it. The people we sold the house to, the very first thing they did was just level the strawberries. <laughs> I thought, well, they were dumb to do that. Well, they didn't care anything about strawberries. You know, everything that you owned that you like. Let me tell you a little secret that I learned when my parents passed and when Mary Lou's mother passed. Your parents save things for their children. And then when they die and you're the children, you get rid of all that junk. Things that were so precious to them don't mean doodly to you. We've had a little conversation with our kids. Is there anything around here you want of course, my daughter says, I want everything, Dad. <laughs> my son says, I don't want nothing. You know, when we die, they'll sell us yard sale. And it meant so much to us. Are you following the point? Jesus said, when you die, who's going to get all this precious farm that you got? But then Jesus said, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There was something missing in this rich farmer's life. 
he did not save or put treasures in heaven. He left God on the top of his life. You can have everything there is on this earth. If you don't have God, you ain't got nothing. And if you've got God, and I said this in Africa, do you know, even though you have nothing, you are very rich with God because of your great faith? It is interesting how the people that have absolutely nothing can be so happy. People that have everything are as sad as they can be. This is true. Our heavenly treasures are eternal. That's what should be important to us. Anxious is a word that simply means care, thought, or worry that is void of trust in God. The word care or worry or thought is used in Scripture, and Paul used it in regards to the churches. He said, I have all of these issues, these problems, these cares, and so forth, but I have the daily care of the churches. Paul wasn't talking about that he was so worried himself sick that, that he was not trusting in God. It's just the fact that he cared about the churches and he did all he could to help them with God's help. Being anxious that is sinful and worrying that is sinful is that you leave God out of the plan. You leave God out of your thought process. We'll talk about more specifically what you do when that happens. But the reality of it is this idea of anxious is about it's like being pulled apart in two different directions. In the English, it means to strangle. So when you worry, you're just strangling yourself. But when you worry, biblically, you're being pulled in two different directions. And the perfect example is in Luke 10 and verse 41. And in that text, that is the text that involves Martha and Mary. Remember that story? Jesus comes to their house, crowd of people there. So what's the first thing a woman's going to do when she's got a crowd of people in her home? She's got to run to the kitchen and start whooping up something. All right? So Martha's in there just whooping it up. And where's Mary? She's not in there helping Martha. She's in there sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to Jesus. So what does Martha do? Martha has the courage, the wherewithal, to march right in there to where Jesus is teaching and interrupt the Lord teaching a Bible class and said, Lord, would you mind telling my sister to get up from there and get in the kitchen and help me cook the beans and potatoes? Now, can't you just see a woman doing that? Well, if you've got a sister and you're doing all the work, you, you know where Martha was. Your lazy, good-for-nothing sister ain't in there helping you. And we got all these people to feed. Jesus responded to her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious or worried. She's pulled in two different directions. She's being strangled about too many things. He says, there's only one thing that's important. And Mary has chosen that good thing, and it will not be taken away from her. Uh, what did Jesus answer, Martha? No, I'm not going to ask Mary to go in there and help you cook the beans. That's the end of the story. My question is, what did Martha do? Did she go back in the kitchen and start throwing pans around and fussing <laughs> mad and stuff? Or did she just politely sit down with a red face and just let the beans burn? I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what she did. Well, let's talk.
stop and think just a moment to see. What was Martha concerned about? She was being hospitable. Is that wrong? No. What would you call eating? Important? Important. But I put another word on it. Essential. Essential. Did you know that Jesus said there is something that trump, trumps essential. It's when it's spiritual. So I'm kind of changing my verbalization of trying to talk to parents that have young kids involved in activities. For a long time, I just used the verbiage that, well, you know, a ball game. Uh, you know, when, when a five-year-old is playing baseball for the world championship, and they, they have world championships in every little town. And I would say, well, you know, that's not important. But that's not true. It is important to a five-year-old. It is important. And if it's important to a five-year-old, it's important to their parents. So they, they gotta go through all of that to deal with that. And that world championship, is right during the time of worship services or a meeting or you know that sort of thing. So there's just a choice. They're being pulled in two different directions. The parents are being strangled. They're hoping it rains so it don't they don't have to you know deal with that. Okay. So here's what I've tried to change my. Th there are things that are important. I, I'm not going to say that those little games are not important anymore. They are important, but are they essential? No. Is there anything more important than even essential? Yes. What is that? God. So here's important. Here's the world championship. Here's essential things. And here's spiritual things. Would I ever, ever do that which is important? skip the essential and the spiritual people do it all the time Jesus said we ain't going to do that eating is essential you ever heard of fasting why do people fast well eating is essential people went days without eating why because there was something spiritual that was more important they dedicated themselves to something spiritual and left off the essentials. Sleep, eating, drinking. It's a powerful lesson. So Jesus is saying, don't be anxious. Don't be worried about the essentials because there's something more important. As I said earlier, Jesus expresses his care for the birds and the lilies and the grass. Are you not worth much more than that? Let's stop right there. I'm not a big preaching, teaching person in regards to low self-esteem, those kinds of things. I think they are important. Did not the Lord say, love your neighbors, you love yourself, so should you love yourself? Yeah, but we don't need to get carried away with that. I think he's simply saying that you treat other people the way you would like to be treated is his point. Okay? I love myself enough to eat and sleep and get in out of the rain. Well, I should show that kind of concern about other people. All right? But your worth, your value. Sunday morning, I started off with the idea that each of you is just as important as anyone else in this local congregation. Because I've been around long enough to know that there are some brethren that just don't feel like they're any higher than a snake's belly. And it affects them. It affects their worship. It affects their life. Jesus died for you. That is God saying in a powerful way. He loves you and you're important. 
are you not worth much more than they? They who? The immediate antecedents of that in that text is birds and lilies and grass. And Jesus just bragged about how beautiful they were and how God took care of them. We read the story again, third reference to the same story. Jesus on the boat. He's sleeping. The storm comes. They wake him up. Do you not care that we're perishing? He rebuked them. Oh, ye of little faith, why are you so cowardly, unbelieving, untrusting, when the creator of the universe is right there? We, of all people on this planet, should never worry, should never be anxious, in that we are out of our mind concerned about what's going to happen next because we feel like our whole life is out of control because who's president? Or who's on the Supreme Court? Who's governor? Now I can have concern about that and I can go vote. But where it becomes sinful is that we think our whole life is going to be turned upside down and there's no way for us to be the kind of people that God wants us to be because there's a certain person in a particular office. When, Romans 13 says, God, in Acts 17, God puts each and every person that is in office there. He has an intent and purpose for them. I don't know what that is. He didn't consult me one bit about how he was going to do that. But I know that he used Cyrus. I know he used Nebuchadnezzar. I know he used lots of people to do his bidding, and he used bad people to carry out his good purpose. Now, I can be just as unhappy as I can be about who I voted for and they didn't get in. I voted for people and they got in, and I wish I hadn't voted for them. That ever happened? So what you going to do now? May I suggest to you, just as I don't try to preach rarely, if ever, my judgment or my opinion, because it's not worth 15 cents. But I'm going to give you my 15 cents worth, and I'm not going to charge you for it, okay? <laughs> Stop watching the news. What's it do? It depresses you. It's almost right up there with the weather report. <laughs> There's 20% chance of rain tomorrow to see. That's 80% it's going to be sunshine. What do they emphasize? The 20%. We've become used to the fact that people always telling us bad news, the, the bad story. I'm more interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is defined as good news. Brother and sister in Christ, we are feeding on bad news daily. And it's depressing us, it's worrying us, and we just can't hardly stand ourselves because we don't know which way to turn. My question is, where is your faith? Where is your trust in God? Don't get me wrong. I care if the stock market crashes. I care if the interest rates go up, but what in the world am I going to do about it? I'm just going to trust God. There's times for us to act. But there's times that we're just going to have to put our faith in God. The person that's president today, you may not like them. God put him there. That doesn't mean God approves of all he does. God's got plans. So how do you stop worrying? In the context, there's bunches of other things in the Bible. I, I'd be here for 40 days and 40 nights to talk about all of those things. But I want to concentrate on what this context talks about. How do you stop worrying? Jesus said it very plainly. you got to trust God. That's what he was saying. Fourth time, 
Same story. That's what Jesus said to his disciples on this one. You say I'm the Son of God. You see the miracles I perform. And then we get in a little tough spot here, and the wind blows, and the rain's coming, and so forth, and you're getting all upset. Where's your faith? You say you believe, but you don't. We say we trust God, but let a little trial come, and we just fall to pieces. Where's your faith? He says, seek first. God. Seek me. Well, what does that mean? Priority? What's most important? The reign of God in our hearts is primary. What would you think of a person that every time you said something to them or you acted in such a way that you were upset or concerned about whether it was the president or the Supreme Court or the mayor of Trustful, I don't know if the mayor of Trustful has a mayor, but, but, but anyway, whatever is going on, but whoever got the dog catcher in the county, whatever. And you're upset about that. And every time this person responds, don't worry about it. God's in control. And you hear them say that about the 14th time, you just like, oh, you're just sick of hearing that. Because it don't seem to help me much. You know why it doesn't help you not much? Because you don't believe it. If you don't trust and believe in God that he's going to take care of it, then you worry about it. Now, am I preaching truth here? Is this what the Lord is talking about? Paul said, God is to have first place in everything. What does he mean, everything? Well, everything but politics. Everything but my job. Everything but my health. What are you going to do when the doctor says, you've got six months? You're going to fall apart? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to hear that. I don't want the doctor to tell me that. But I live long enough. That's going to happen. I know this is morbid, and it's probably too morbid for most but I'll say it, because I think it's true. My wife and I are always talking about, well, we need to lose a pound. We need to walk a mile. We need to eat better. We need to fry. You know, we need so many desserts. We didn't say no desserts. <laughs> Not as much. And I told my wife, I said, you know, that, that's fine. Moderation is good. And I've been like a yo-yo through my life. I've been one of the great, big, huge preachers of the brotherhood. I've got all kinds of different size suits, you know, from fat to medium to skinny. And I told her, I said, you know what's going to be the deal? I'm going to, I'm going to live my life on this earth, not eating all the chocolate cake I want. And I said, I'm not dying of carbon. <laughs> Any problems? And to my knowledge, the Lord's not going to serve chocolate cake in heaven. <laughs> so I best get now. Now, people don't like to talk like that. They don't like to think like that. And the older I get, it maybe it's not as funny as it was when I was 30. Here's the reality. What are we worried about? We die. We get to go to heaven. We get to be with the Lord. You know the problem with most of us as Christians? As the old saying goes, bus pulls up Sunday morning, Going to heaven. Announcement is made in the local church. Here's the bus to heaven. You can go right now if you want to go. All you have to do is get on the bus. You're going to heaven. Majority of people would not walk out the door to get on that bus. They ain't ready to go to heaven. Why? Well, you got kids, you got grandkids, you know, you got stuff you got to do, things you want to do, you know, you're not ready, you're not this, you're not that. You trust the Lord with all your heart? Do you? 
get on the bus. I talk to Christians. When I say that, they say, man, you wouldn't have to ask me. If I saw that bus pull up, I, I'd be out the door. I'd be getting on the radio. My mother's, or my, excuse me, my wife's grandfather lived to be just shy of 105. He couldn't hear thunder. He couldn't see very well. His body was just shot, but he still had his mind. So I'm screaming at him one day to try to make conversation. And he looked at me and he said, I think God has forgotten me. He said, everybody I ever know is dead. <laughs> I thought, hmm, I guess that's true. You know what? He was ready to go home. He was waiting for that bus to pull up. He'd have crawled out there to get on that bus. What about you? I'm ready to go to heaven, but not just right now. When this text says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his righteousness in the context, I believe, is talking about a changed life. You remember Jesus throughout the Sermon on the Mount? You heard it said of old, you shall not. But I say unto you, then he says something that we should do. Jesus is all about changing our lives. Changing our lives into conformity with God's will. When you trust God with all of your heart, You'll change your life. So if you're worried about your clothes, you're worried about your food, you're worried about the wrong thing. You need to be worrying about your soul. Make that your priority. The rest of it will take care of itself. Trusting God to take care of all the rest. Lifting up your prayers, your thoughts, your concerns to God. And leave it. Let Him take care of it. Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Let's ask you a simple question. Rhetorical. Do you believe that? Then live it. And when you live it, when you live it like Jesus talked about in our text, you will not worry. You know, God is still on the throne. I don't know how many times I've said that during COVID. We was all freaking out. Do you get the shot? Do you not get the shot? Do you get the boot or do you not get the boot? Do you wear the mask? Do you not wear the mask? You know, what do you do? There, at the beginning, we were, all care, we, we, we were all concerned about dying, right? We thought it was going to be like the bubonic plague or something. We was all going to die. How many times were we lied to? How many times did we told different things? Follow the science and they didn't follow the science. I mean, there's a list a mile long, right? Brethren all over the brotherhood were on every side possible. Churches split. Brethren left the church. And all the while, God Almighty is still sitting on the throne, ruling all things. And we completely lost our minds. Did people die? Yes. Even good Christian people die. But God is still on his throne. So what does that mean? We're not going to live here forever. Stop living your life like you are. Because you're not going to be here forever. Prepare for the home you're going to be at forever. That is Christ's point. You 
listen very patiently. I appreciate that. To me, it's a lesson that I have to preach to myself every day. Because there's so many concerns and so many worries. I'm like Martha. Not that I'm in the kitchen cooking anything. But I'm in the kitchen cooking a lot of stuff. It doesn't amount to much. And Jesus said there's really only one thing that takes a sense. Make sure you don't forget that. The most important. Well, tonight, you may be here and not a Christian. I guess this, everyone here is. But remember back when you made that covenant relationship with your Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. God said, I forgive you of everything you ever did. You said, I accept that, and the terms of the covenant is, I will be faithful to you all of my life. God not broken his promise that we trust him, obey him, and he will save us. So we're going to sing the song, Trust and Obey. Very appropriate. <coughs> trust and <coughs> obey. Obey We can help you anyway. Why don't you come as we stand and sing? <coughs> when we walk with the Lord in the
Maddie is doing better. Christy's just kind of feeling eh, blah. Uh, she feels like she, I don't know, might have what what Maddie has, even though she's tested multiple times and it was it, it was negative. But um, that's why they're not here here tonight. Um, what other announcements need to be made? The Harpers are all sick. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the Harpers are, are all sick and not feeling good tonight. Anything else? I've got something. Um, I don't know. Any of you all that are friends with Caitlin on Facebook have probably seen her posting about the Francisco Gomez family. Um, it'll be two weeks Saturday. Terrible car wreck, head-on collision, killed the mother, killed the son three sons. Um, they're a Hispanic family, you can tell by the last name, but unfortunately um, mom was divorced from dad of the boys, had remarried, um, and the consensus at this point is that dad and stepdad are both illegal. So trying to figure out what to do with about the boys at this point in time is been a little concerning and they are definitely a well-loved family well-loved children within that community and you know this is a small community that they live in um, stepdad works at one of the local factories so there's concern that his the confusion over him may bring him into that factory and there are other people who might be affected by that um, so whatever your viewpoint is on illegals, just realize they have families and their lives can be severely affected. Um, they have still not buried mom and Christian. One son is still in the hospital in Louisville with some major, possibly life-changing injuries. Um, the community is rallying around them and, and I believe that financially their needs are being met. They do have other family within that community. In fact, um, cousin of the, of the one that passed um, is very, very dear friend of JT's. And this has been very hard on, on our family um, and how to support them. So if you could just remember the Francisco Gomez family and all the ways that they might need to be lifted up. one verse to one another and Lo will wish you safe travels will you be going back tonight or tomorrow you'll be going back tonight all right tell Mary Lou we missed her love to have seen her after we sing this we'll be dismissed in a closing prayer blessed be the time that binds our hearts in spiritual feasts that have been provided for us. We pray, Father, that uh, our hearts have been receptive. And we're so thankful for uh, all that you've done for us. We pray, Father, that you would bless him, be with Lowell as he travels tonight back to his home, give him a safe trip. We pray, Father, that you would bless us as we uh, continue through the rest of this week, that you would give us safety home tonight. And as was mentioned, Father, we pray that you'd be with the Gomez family in their time of trial. And we pray that uh, your name would be glorified in all things. And we're mindful of those of our own number who are sick and not able to be here tonight. We pray your blessings upon them that they would be healed. Forgive us of our sins. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.